We're at the Christopher Cutts Gallery, and I'm sitting here with the artist Matt Brown, and we're looking at one of Matt's pieces. Uh, in fact, this is the most recent work you've done, and if I'm correct, the largest formatted work you've done to date. Yep, definitely the largest one I've ever done. And, and is this picture not basically the first 20 years of the 21st century? Yeah, exactly. It was sort of commemorating the year 2020, and exactly that as the, the, the first... Two, yeah. de two decades of the 21st century. The compositional structure, it's more complicated in this one, but it's always based on this sort of um, a structure of three, like past, present, and future. And that's something that they use as a narrative structure in a lot of Northern Renaissance paintings, where on the, uh, in the background on the left would be the past, mm -hmm. and the foreground in the center would be the present, and then the background on the right would be the future. Ah. And so you have that sort of beginning, middle, and end of a story, sort of a narrative structure. We pop over here. Now we see uh, a, a young woman looking out a window, the bear factory. Yeah, and China in the background. Right. The underlying story is sort of a cartoon version of the, the Western narrative that everybody sort of has on their radar right now, which, you know, would be the future. The future of this century would be... Hmm. China. The present in this piece would be the, the year 2020. So it really is like a very literal people inside their rooms, mm -hmm. individuals separated, but also um, something that I've used in, in a lot of other series of work was the idea of uh, the transition of the ages. So in a platonic sense, you have like the great year and it's just it lasts around 2100 years mm -hmm. and so like the musical hair you know the dawning of the age of Aquarius right we've been entering the age of Aquarius essentially for the last hundred years and so the beginning of the 21st century also marks the end of the age of Pisces and so you have like the symbol of the two fish and then that's contrasted on the other side or continued with the, the symbol of, for Aquarius like the pouring out of the pitcher of water Compositionally, you said that uh, it's based on a, a painting by the Renaissance painter Petrus Christus. Yeah, that's that's right. I, uh, my favorite gallery in uh, Berlin is the Gemälde Gallery, and it's they've got lots of stuff, but it's primarily Northern Renaissance collections of those things. And mm -hmm. like I said before, there's many many depictions of the Last Judgment, like you know Van Eyck and all these different. People. Probably the most famous the, one would be yeah, Michelangelo's exactly. in the Sistine Chapel. Yeah, there's yeah, and there's so so many versions. But <clears throat> I came across this one by Petrus Christus in the Gemalda Gallery, and um, it just had a different kind of a feeling to it. It wasn't, I mean, whether it's intentional or not, who knows? You know, it was like 500 years ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, the figures are essentially in this very same pose as they are in this piece, with the um, the spear going into the mouth and the sort of foot holding. So that would be the down. angel Michael coming down, slewing Satan? Yeah, exactly. But then in this piece, it's less of a battle between good and evil and more of like a, a kind of S&M uh, dominating, but not a versus, not a fight, more like a continuation of the same thing or a relationship. Because the devil in this represents oil or the age of oil. And then the angel is, you know, covered into... It's, it's a, cyborg android yeah type thing. It, 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 so absolutely. it's an AI it's, it's literally it? like the age of oil and then the sort of technological information age I notice when I'm looking at it compositionally I see the alpha sign over there in the moon yeah with a bit of a winky I guess it's winking yeah emoji the emoji. there and then uh, what am I seeing over omega, here the, the omega the omega sign in the frowning sun yeah and uh, um, some compositional devices are utilizing those. Um, yeah, that's can you point the, those out to us. Yeah, that's the whole sort of that's a general symbolic structure of, of the composition. So you have the omega symbol is the ocean, and it's really got that. Yeah, you can, you can see it. If you literally get it around there, and it surrounds. Yeah, it. and it's and the dissection of the of the water is kind yeah. of you know making that work, and then the alpha symbol being the spear, and then the laser beams making that sort of. So we're looking at these these diagonals. Yeah, right? exactly. And I put I put the symbols on the moon and the sun yeah. just to to echo it. Eh? Yeah, to line it up, to sort of make it more obvious. Uh -huh. In the Northern Renaissance, they use those symbols all the time. They're really ubiquitous symbols, like the beginning and the end. And so, so it's just, 
it, compositionally, it's it's very balanced. It's almost almost pyramidal, like, you know. Yeah, so totally. Drag, we're doing, doing, we're and pretty we're gonna... pretty simple. It's really yeah. the whole thing is really based on threes as well. Like you have red, green, and blue, and you have like the, right. the red, green, and blue, and then you have the uh, the green in the middle and the red and the blue on the side. So it's all repeated triangles over and over again. I see groups of figures sitting on these interior bridges. You got the group here all looking at their cell phones. Yeah. I guess that's pretty, you got the group there. Uh, looks like they got those VR headsets on. Yeah, exactly. These figures, which are in the Last Judgment, usually on church pews up in the sky next to God, uh, they're basically the like the just or the right, like all the saints or all the holy people who are sitting in judgment with whoever, God. Uh, so in this case, they're and because good or God is represented by information technology, you have people on their phones, like you said, yeah. and people on VR, and it was sort of just a little joke to myself that. They're the three, uh, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, but they're judges. I guess all of it is really a satire of that whole Christian concept of good defeating evil and having some sort of a promise of utopia in the future after the thousand years of war and mm -hmm. then you eventually get this, this prize of utopia. And that's sort of baked into the Western narrative in a general sense, like whether it's technological progress that will eventually bring us to colonize Mars or any of these yeah. other types of like uh, teleological endpoints, like goals, like the goal of Western progress is some sort of a thing that is better than where we are. So, so instead of it being a fight between um, good and evil or information technology and oil, it's more of a it's more of a dance. It's more of a, a play between those two things because they're well. It does not directly related. They need one another. Or certainly, technology wouldn't have well, yeah. be, be where it is if it didn't have the oil industry. Exactly, it grew out of the oil industry, and I think we often forget when we're talking about social media or all these positive changes. None of those cell phones would exist. None of these other things would exist without the processing of hydrocarbons into plastic right. and all of these other things that come out of directly out of that industrial revolution and oil so you have the oil that's going through hell and then you have the internet going under the ocean connecting like and that's for real connect, that, yeah that's totally real yeah. yeah yeah for sure and it's actually mind-blowing it's amazing like people know about but rarely think about the physical aspect of the internet i mean we use it on our phones all the time but there's so much physical infrastructure now you got these um these rats yeah. Lab rats that uh, look like they're, I guess they're cyborgs of some sort. <laughs> and they're, they're a totally real thing that people have been doing since the, I think since the 70s, maybe even earlier. There were all these different experiments, as we don't like to think about, but a lot of these sort of technologies interacting with organisms have been tested on organisms, for the most part animals. And the rat is like, uh, especially the white lab rat, is a amazing symbol of science's interaction with with animals with organisms and so yeah, yeah. what what people have done is they put these electrodes into the specific areas of the brain of the rat and in order to um, either stop its decision making or change its decision making so in this case when they've gotten pretty far with that technology is they can have a camera on the back of the rat and you could really literally have a remote control rat so somebody is sitting there watching the camera and has a joystick and is making the rat go left and right or stop or start. And so these are, there's three of them again, like the triangle right. thing. And uh, I think I think that these little cyborg rats are such a, such a great example of, or I don't know if it's even an example or a metaphor or what, but they're such a good symbol for our relationship to technology. Even though there's no electrodes going into our brains, we're still massively affected by mm. the emotions that our phones create, mm. the way that we feel based on what's going on on that device, all of those kinds of, those kinds of really, it's a really simple symbol, but it's also, I think, a really important and powerful part of where we are right now is how affected we are by technology and how intimately affected, like how subtly affected. Oh, yeah. 
So you have these these two two-headed figures. Right. The one on the left is uh, Geron Lanier and Judea Pearl, and on the right is um, Mark Zuckerberg and uh, Sergey Brin. Right. So Geron Lanier and Judea Pearl are sort of the the invisible side of the algorithms and computer technology that we use today. They're the people who developed basically the math that goes into... The scientists. Well, and many other people, but they're just two good symbolic choices of people who created those algorithms and created that math. And then these guys on the right are sort of the corporate implementation of those same... Much more algorithms. recognizable faces. Yeah, they're know, the public figures. Yeah. And Jaron Laney is kind of a... I know he's a, uh, an interesting character figure. for sure. Yeah, but, but so much more so the. Well, Mark who doesn't Zuckerberg know who these two guys are? Yeah, yeah. Sergey Brin. Yeah. But back in the um, back in the early '90s, when Silicon Valley was kind of like blowing up or developing, there was this experiment that was done, where I can't remember the name of the guy, but uh, he got he got a few hundred people together in an auditorium. Didn't tell them why they were there. It was probably part of some other tech conference or something like that. So he had a large audience of people, and mm -hmm. it was divided down the middle, and everybody had one of these paddles in their hand. On one side of the paddle, it's red, reflective red, and on the other side, it was this reflective green. Okay. And just a little paddle, and everybody was in the room, sitting there, didn't know why, what, you know, in anticipation of what's going to happen, they don't know. And then there's a big screen in front of them, and up on the screen, there's all these little red and green dots sort of sparkling away and people started noticing that when they moved their paddle like okay those dots are moving and the paddles moving and if I switch red and green okay they're switching and oh that's me up there I'm switching it red and green oh so one of the paddles related to, to every individual in the audience okay to, and, so a mark on the screen yeah okay. and the audience was divided in two so there's all these people on this side and all these people on that side and they are and you could see clearly on the screen was also divided into two and once people realized that they're little paddle represented a, basically a pixel, whether it was red or green, up on the screen, you know, the audience like had this sort of elated eruption of excitement. They're like, wow, we're part of this thing that's being sure. projected. And then the experiment started. So they, the organizers projected um, the game Pong. Oh yeah. And it's a very simple kind of the ball yeah, the, moving the paddle from on one side, side of the yeah, screen to the other. You yeah, exactly. And hit it back like you're playing ping pong. Yeah, and on the bottom of each paddle, it's it's red on top and green on the bottom. And people realized that if they showed red, the paddle would go up. If they showed green, the paddle would go down. And so now, for the, where the, the audience you says is, is divided in two. Yeah. And so one half is controlling. One side and the other side, so they the other they, side, yeah. yeah. Okay. And so people people realized what was happening, and people sort of, but again, nobody was prompted or given any sort of uh, explanation. But there they, had to be uh, they figured, cooperation. Yeah, they figured it out on their own. But what happened was really quickly, the paddle on either side was functionally playing that game. And if everybody on one side showed red, the paddle would go all the way up to the top, and the ball would miss. Yeah. So p individuals had to decide whether they would show red or green to really accurately adjust where, huh. not just top or bottom, but the whole gradient in between to actually play the game. Okay. And so to this day, there's not a really a good explanation of how that works in a group, but, bas but basically it's an example. And Does it, it work? Were they able to? They were able to play really well, yeah. You know. And people, and, and better, the longer they played, the, the better they got. And it's not about people talking to each other saying, hey, you show red, I'll show green, and then we'll do this. It's so sort of some it's really, conscious thing. It's really, a, yeah. And so what it's been labeled is it's called a subconscious consensus. Ah. And there's lots and lots of study around it, but this is one of those early experiments that has become sort of symbolic of what the internet and what social media has become in a certain way, is that everybody has their individual little node and they're in their participation in this in this much larger system. Mm -hmm. And if you put different controls on that, you can have a different a different result. Like so the controls that were put on that experiment were incredibly simple, which is up and down or play this game, okay. you know. And so it's kind of it's a it's I thought it's a good metaphor. It's been used in uh, right. uh, some important films and it's it's been used as an example of an early example of how curious 
that kind of group mind is. I see this kind of looks like a, a hypodermic needle. Is that, am I looking at that? A hollow needle inside of a, a carbon atom? Is yeah, that what yeah, that or is? it's like a hydrocarbon, which is basically, you know, what, what we use, the molecules we use from oil, the way we separated right. it. So hydrocarbons are basically... And this is basically like sticking it down in there and sucking the juice out of Earth or yeah, something? Yeah, and what I was going to get at was that, that this whole space, this whole like empty chasm under the ocean was once full of oil and then we've drained it. And so this hypodermic needle type of thing, it it goes up and it connects to the uh, oil rig. There. Ah, so you have the oil rig. Of and course. Then coming out of the top of the oil rig is this... You got orange pipe or tube or whatever. Yeah, and it's and all it's kind of you yeah, see it, it weaves, weaves, weaves right back down. Yeah, and it weaves through through the oil as as part of that narrative to be to be showing that it's been drained out. It's it's all part of the same thing, and it's connected up. It's sort of a tug of war between these two robots, which ah, yes. like the uh, sort of cyborg angel and everything. They're a sort of representation of human form mm -hmm. but as a machine so there's one that's run by oil and so you can see the the oil that's being drained out of here it goes back and then it connects up to the that's literally it's the pipeline, gas tank right? yeah. yeah so that would be and there's a little exhaust coming out of this thing but that's actually from that's a um, that's an industrial revolution uh, robot yeah exactly that? and then this one would be a more contemporary electric Robot. For so sure, you, have, you see all of the yeah, and much it's, higher tech. And, and that's the Boston Dynamics. Like that's a contemporary robot right now. I mean, this the, is an actual yeah, sort of leading the leading AI. edge of, of humanoid robots right. at Boston Dynamics. And this one is from a film that is basically a critique of of exponential progress. It's a uh, it's the guy it's Katsuhiro Otomo. He's the same he's the same guy who made Akira. Okay, one of the most sort of um, Iconic uh, anime films ever made in in the, I think it's seventy nine or in the eighties. Now here you got uh, uh, they look like little coronaviruses all over, little spiky something. These are yeah, they're, this, these, they're, uh, these viruses are bacteria. Or? Those are all viruses. There are fourteen different uh, morphologies of viruses, so there's many, many, many more. But yeah. those are fourteen different shapes that viruses can come in. And then you have these like little uh, uh, tools or gears or what, what's going on there? Yeah, and again, like uh, in terms of this... Oh, yeah, look, I guess they are tools getting more sophisticated. Yeah, it's the something? evolution of tools in a really ah. simplified thing. So you have like the basic stone tool and then arrowhead, and right. then axe head, and then wheel, cog, a and then gear. cog, and then the combustion engine, and then the cell phone. Ah, so, nice. So, but, and that really was like I was saying before that I've been trying to sort of weave in this metaphor of viruses as a metaphor for technology for a long time and that's just literally that it's like 14 different shapes of viruses and then they kind of spiral around the center of the earth and then you have right. an evolution of technology coming out of it uh you know and then there's a little um now am i seeing an ouroboros there totally is two two-headed two-headed snake. snake what's with the number seven on his uh on his head. Wow, yeah. <laughs> well, then I had the seven on the uh, virus as well, so you have a little triangle of three sevens. I just always also thought that uh, part of the work that I was doing, and I realized a long time ago, was to have all of it be one consistent body of work. Mm -hmm. And so, in order to sort of connect that a little bit more, I always based everything either on threes or sevens or 21s in oh. terms of how many things there are, like there's 14 viruses and then seven uh, iterations of technology. And then there's, again, there's uh, seven types of bacteria. And then- What do we got here? We got like fungus and- Those are my favorite thing in the world, the slime mold. Oh, slime mold. And they're, yeah, they're in every piece almost going back for the yeah, last I do 15 years. Yeah, I remember them, yeah. But they're such, they're such a great symbol of, not societies necessarily, but I, I like to use them as a symbol for that, but what they are, what slime mold or some kinds of slime mold are, is they're a bunch of single-celled organisms that are living in an environment on the forest floor, say, and they're literally that. They're like amoebas. They're little single-celled organisms. They're self-sufficient. They eat. They do whatever. And when they start to run out of food, they start to um, they start to uh, come together and 
become basically a little slug. They become a multicellular creature in order to survive, to locomote, to move somewhere where there's more food. And so there are all these individuals and then they come together and they become one larger organism. And then in order to move, some of them have to die in order for that thing to start moving. It's how it moves. Is that what you got here? Yeah, exactly. And then this is a little diagram of it basically. And then once they get to a place where they sense that there's more food, a whole bunch of them start dying. And then they make a little tower and then the healthiest ones of the bunch sporulate and become individuals again. I see um, uh, a red and blue pill. Yes. It looks like it's actually been opened up, okay, and you got the little... Totally. Uh, the magic potions falling out. Yeah, and, and then... Uh, I, see a, I see it in a number of cases. Yes, yeah. all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, that's another sort of... That's a reference to the... At this point, I would say very classic internet meme of the red pill, blue pill. And it, I mean, that matrix, yeah, it comes it? from the matrix, right? When and you, whether you want to live with the blue pill, I believe, live in uh, blissful ignorance, or take the red pill and see the uh, see the horrible reality, to see the horrible truth, to see the, the naked yeah, yeah, truth, yeah. or to be, you know, but but in this blissfully ignorant, but but in <laughs> this in this satire, the pills because they're open here, they're not connected, but. They're the same pill. It's red and blue. I see. Yeah. And she's giving it to him. It's also like sort of on this on this UFO spinning top thing. Yeah. Uh, it's you know it's connected. It's the whole thing. And Is that it. the godlike figure sitting on top of the UFO there? Yeah, exactly. With his fiery sword and you know the sword of judgment and the flower of redemption. Ah. From the from the last judgment. On a spinning top the, with the, all the astrological signs. Yeah, that's my... Uh, that's you. And uh, yeah, then again, to go back to the, the, the changing of the ages or the transition between the, the ages of the zodiac, that's what that's a reference to. The spinning top is actually a symbol for precession, which is... It, it is, I measured it. I used a, protra- what's it, a protractor yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And it's 23.5 degrees, which is the, uh, the axis of the Earth relative to the sun. Okay. And, uh, you know, which gives us our seasons and whatever. But aside from that, the axis of the Earth rotates 360 degrees over the course of uh, 2,100 years. Sorry, over the course of uh, 26,000 years. But divided by 12, then you get it like, you know, you get a decimal place on it. But approximately every 2,100 years is, is one astrological sign. And so we transition through all 12 signs over the course of 26 thousand years i'm interested in behind the ai's leg and then yeah, the the devil's butt. You, well no you got this uh, bubbled environment yeah that looks like it's, it's fractured it's cracking exactly yeah and so if you see the skyline and i see all these are these all your spinal cord or your well, there's the thing. there's that brainstem again yeah in, of course inside the with bubble. a smiley face on it <laughs> <laughs> but it, you can see like with the skyline the color of the sky it's yellow on either side but yes. within the rainbow and the rainbow is again a northern renaissance symbol for uh, uh, like a, the promise of a better future or like the promise oh, yeah. of a coming utopia. That pot but, of gold is just so Yeah, so it's like a blue sky and white clouds underneath the rainbow. And then everything underneath the rainbow is like uh, green technology. So you have windmills, solar panels. I put nuclear in there because there's... Yes, you did. <laughs> but, but it is, it is... And yeah. it, it is really argued to be one of the cleanest forms of. Uh, there's no carbon going. There's no, no carbon waste. Yeah, just yeah. just, just a giant, radioactive. Just a waste. giant toxic explosion eventually. Yeah, yeah, like yeah Chernobyl. Yeah. But okay. and then the bubble, like you're asking about, is just that. It's supposed to be like a a utopia in a bubbled city. It's like these other bubbles, but it's that concept when you see like 1960s like um, Buckminster Fuller utopia illustrations. It's like some kind of bubble with, you know, beautiful perfect society and nature inside this bubble. Hey, just to kind of, let's do full circle. We first started talking about this piece um, with the title. Uh, we we say it's Lapse Judgment, not yeah. Last Judgment. Yeah. And of course you have a character here that looks very familiar to me a little bit, <laughs> carrying yeah. Lapse. Yeah. And it looks like he's carrying a coronavirus totally. too with yeah. him. Like I was saying about the idea of good versus evil not being the focus of this piece, changing the focus of a fight between good and evil to them being sort of part of the same 
a transition, equation. Uh, an evolution. Yeah, exactly, a yeah. transition between two things. Yeah. Okay. And so, last judgment in in a really direct way implies that this is the last time you will be judged by God, and everything after that will be this utopia that you will live in. So the last judgment is like a promise, similar to the other promise yeah, he made after the flood, though. We're going to make that decision this time. Yeah, yeah, with the rainbow is also a reference to that, you know, God, yeah. God's promise. And so in, in this kind of Western narrative of technological progress, yeah. you have this kind of promise. Yeah, everything's been, we fucked up a lot of stuff by creating, you know, climate change and all these different things. But if we just, you know, continue tweaking our technology, we'll get to the point where it's better and better and we can solve all those problems with right, technology. Right, right. So it's a similar concept that the judgment in our in our society, it's, it's not a promise of the last thing. That's the thing that I'm satirizing or joking about, is that in this transition, it's it's lapsed. So it can't be the last judgment of something yeah, because there is no yeah. there is no judgment in that equation because you're removing the good versus evil or the binary aspect it's the same thing transitioning into something new 